So Simon, really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you today. But I just want to share something with you before we kind of get into the, the questions. So I had the opportunity to read your book, To Be The Spark, over the last few days, right? And I realized that I've been kind of lowballing with my team for the last while. Like, I've been kind of telling them we have to be the gold standard of support. And all of a sudden realize we have to be the platinum standard of support. So so thank you for that. You've just helped me to raise the bar and kind of, you know, <laughs> get the team refocused. So really, really love reading your book. Love the insights in it. And hopefully as we kind of go through the questions here, you'll be able to, to share some further insights with our audience today. Awesome. Awesome. So first question, yeah, like your book emphasizes the idea of being the spark in customer service. Like, so can you share maybe a personal story or experience that really inspired this concept and how can it transform customer interactions? Well, it's so good to be with you. Uh, when I went to work for Disney, the first couple of days that Disney is spent at Disney University, and at Disney University is where you sniff the pixie dust, you get the microchip planted in your head, you come out singing, it's a small world after all. And what a lot of people don't know is when the parks get really busy in the summer, it's all hands on deck. So this particular day, I have to go and work on Sunset Boulevard. I'm responsible for sweeping the streets. And I've got on a blue smock, a broom, a dustpan in my hand, and it is hot as it can get hot in Florida. And I'm not happy. I'm not feeling the pixie dust. I'm just like, wah, wah, wah. And... All of a sudden, it dawned on me that the Mickey police might be watching me through the hidden cameras throughout the park. So some guests were coming towards me, and they they looked at my name tag, and they said, you're from Buffalo, New York. I said, yes. They said, we're from Buffalo, New York. And we started chatting. And I said, well, what have you done since you've been here? And they were like, oh, we've gone to Epcot. We've gone to Magic Kingdom. We've gone to Animal Kingdom. I said, now that you're here at MGM, today it's called Hollywood Studios, I said, you got to ride Tower of Terror. And then go and experience Indiana Jones and eat at the Brown Derby. So I said goodbye to them. And then Declan, a couple of hours later, I'm back at my desk and it hit me. Disney never sent me out to the park to sweep the streets. They sent me out to the park to connect with the family that has probably saved three to five years of their discretionary income to only come to Disney for once in their lifetime. And that day, what I realized, because the research, according to Disney Business Analytics, is that a family of four in a seven-day stay will spend about $10,000. So Disney never sent me out to the park to sweep the streets. They sent me out to the park to create a moment for guests who may never come back. That absolutely changed my life. I love that example, you know, you're really putting the, the customer front and center and really understanding what it means for the customer to be undertaking that particular activity and how you can then add value and, you know, create that magic moment, as you said, really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And everything I've learned there is good about creating that platinum service moment, that little something extra for nothing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love the concept. That example, I say, really, really resonates. Um, it, in your view, like how can leaders foster an environment of kind of operational excellence that really empowers employees like to deliver this type of exceptional service, like you know, to deliver those magic moments? And who would you say is a, a leader who successfully embodies this principle? Well, the first thing leaders can do is to think about the employee and team member experience when uh, individuals join their company. So, for example, our daughter recently had a college internship. And when she went her first day to work at the company, they had asked her a lot of personal things about herself. What does she like? And they had her whole cubicle decorated, pimped out, like to welcome her the first day. The reason that's important, because this is really like her first real corporate type of internship. And all of a sudden, she never stopped talking about it. Even when the internship ended, she's like, I think I want to go and work there because an experience has been created for. So I think that everyone listening to us, they can do three things. Number one, how do we begin to find out what's important to employees? What makes them come alive? Number two, what's their appreciation language? Research says one minute of recognition creates 100 minutes of initiative. So how do we recognize when people are doing things right on behalf of the customer? And then number three, share the story 
of what went well and what did we learn as we serve the customer because facts tell but stories sell i i love that idea of, of developing the story particularly around what worked well where is the opportunity to, to improve I, I love the idea of creating a, a story out of it because i think you're right like you can get a lot of data points but they don't really tell the customer experience they don't really tell what what happened or what, what it felt like from a customer perspective and getting that story out there is fundamental and I love the story about your daughter and the fact that they customize her work environment to really kind of resonate and make her feel at home and, and feel welcome. And who would you say is a leader who successfully embodies that principle of, of really creating that right operational environment for you know, a team or employees to really deliver? One of the best examples I can give you right now is Chewy.com. Chewy.com, what they do for the pet owner is they go above and beyond, but they obviously do it with their team. So I was working with a group and this lady came up to me after this customer service workshop and she said she received her pet food subscription and her dog had died. And she calls Chewy, gets a person on the 800 number, and they're like, we're sorry for your dog passing away. You can perhaps donate the food to a pet shelter and we will refund your money. And she thought that was the end of the transaction. The next day, her doorbell rings and there's a guy outside the door with a sympathy card and a bouquet of flowers from who? Chewy.com. Because they understood if she ever gets a pet in the future, who is she going to call first? The customer service company that created the last impression. And Chewy does it better. And I just thought this was a one-off. And just last week, a lady told me, uh, in another workshop, she said Chewy contacted her and asked her to send a picture of her dog. A few weeks later, she gets a hand painting of her dog that now hangs at her house, free of charge, didn't ask her to pay anything because Chewy understands when you create that emotional moment for the customer, it becomes the emotional deposit into their emotional bank account and the customer becomes your unofficial marketing department. I love that concept, the emotional moment, and you know, really getting the customer, as you say, to be your marketing department and be your best advocate. That is, that's, you know, that is really incredible, and it has a real flight wheel effect for any business when, when that happens. You mentioned the concept of brilliance blockers, where leaders can actually hinder service quality or service experience. Like, What are the common mistakes that leaders make that block the brilliance of their teams, and how can they overcome these challenges? So point in case, I, I am a prime example of a leader who was probably a bit over my skis. Number one, I was a micromanager. So don't micromanage individuals. Number two, ask versus tell. I ran an adult daycare center and you didn't have all the answers. You were not smart. You had to come to Papa to learn how to think and how to answer. Dead wrong. People don't learn unless you ask them a question and then they start to find their way. Number three, don't ever forget to say thank you. Thank you for doing a great job because what gets recognized gets repeated. And those are just some of the hard lessons that I learned when I worked at Disney because if I didn't change how I was leading, I was modeling something that will ultimately impact the guest experience. Very good. I, li I like that trio of don't micromanage, ask, and thank uh, the person. I uh, love it. V very simple, but very effective. You talk also about emotional congruence in companies, and it's something that is important. And how can business practically implement this concept to ensure that their purpose aligns with their profit goals? And what impact does this alignment have on customer loyalty? Well, first of all, let's start with the research. According to Gallup, 70, 70 percent of human decision making is emotional, 30 percent rational. So when people emotionally connect with the brand, what Gallup says, they will spend more, pay a higher margin and tell others about it. So how do you get there? First of all, it's starting with the why we create the experience for the customer. Everything that I've learned in 36 years of, of business is customer service is a department, but customer love is a mindset. So businesses, number one, have to teach the mindset of emotional connection, emotional congruence, become 
emotionologist, which is a, a word that I have created. Okay. That's number one. Then number two, how do we begin to look at our customer satisfaction scores, our net promoter scores? What are the numbers telling us? When our customers engage, what's their feedback? Um, it's not so much what happens, it's all in the recovery. So if something happens, how quickly are we recovering and empathizing with that customer, coming alongside them to say, you know what? You're right. We have dropped the ball. How do we make this right? And then I think third, it's understanding that whenever you get feedback, that it doesn't stay in one department, but you share it across the enterprise. So everyone is learning. How do we level up in the customer experience as we're understanding the customer journey? The concept of recovery, I think, is really, really important because like one thing that I kind of say to, to my team on a regular basis is, look, at people don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to ring intercom support team. Like, it's not what they want to do. If they've got to do that, something has gone wrong. Something's not working out for them. And you really got to look at it from, from that perspective. And you really got to think about that recovery. How, how do you make it you know, right for the customer? How do you make sure that you know, ultimately you solve the issue, you solve the problem? And you really got to look at it through that lens. So uh, I really love that concept. And also the concept of customer love. I worked for an organization where they actually called their support organization the Department of Customer Love. And I, I thought it was a really good naming uh, convention and kind of resonates with what you were talking about, Simon. But in a world driven by profit, like how crucial is it for businesses to focus on creating meaningful and purpose for their employees and customers? And can you share an example where you think, you know, that has been successfully integrated into the business model? So what I'm seeing with companies right now across many different industries, and I'll use the hospitality industry specifically, what I've discovered with Hilton Hotels and even some Marriott's, they have drilled down on when a guest checks into a hotel, how to ensure from the time they pull up, maybe they're driving, they're being dropped off by one of the rideshare services that they're greeted. And if you know their name uh, or you ask them their name, even before they hit the front desk to check in. And now with uh, people who don't even go to the front desk, they have digital keys, they can go right to their room. What is the way that at least digitally you connect with them? So I am a Hilton uh, frequent stare. And one of the things that I've noticed is if I've checked in digitally, I will either get a call or a text. Welcome to the Hilton. How's your stay? What can we do? I may never see the person at the front desk, but that personalized message goes a long way. I'll give you another example. What I'm also noticing when you go into certain uh, retail locations now, you are greeted, eye contact, hello, how are you? And then even at the checkout, it's not just let me do the transaction, let me take a moment to make sure that you are seen, valued, and understood. What that does for a customer in a world where they are saying roughly globally, seven out of 10 people are dealing with stress, depression, anxiety, when they interact with a business, is that business seeing the human person? Let's say they never see somebody physically on the phone. Is there a warm smile in the voice of the person that is interacting with that customer? That becomes an emotional deposit into their emotional bank account. So that concept of seen, valued, understood, like obviously, you know, looking from a customer perspective is paramount. But I think you're also saying looking at that from an employee perspective is, is really critical as well to really drive that kind of, you know, connection and, and kind of, a, you know, the ability to then be able to push into the emotional bank of the customer. Absolutely. The formula for everyone to think about is leaders create the experience for team members. Team members create the experience for customers. Customers drive revenue. Reverse engineer. Revenue comes from customers who have been engaged by team members who've been engaged by leaders. Sounds simple, but not not everyone is doing it to, to a level that makes sense. So lots of opportunity for businesses to learn from that simple model. In your book, uh, which I said I've had the opportunity to read over the last few days and kind of compelling reading, really enjoyed it. But like you do outline five platinum service principles, right? I'd love to maybe elaborate on one of these principles that you believe is the most critical, even though I understand they're all critical, but is there one that above the others you think is really important for 
people to look at when it comes to transforming customer experience from the ordinary to the extraordinary? Out of the five principles, the one that I would highlight that is the glue, I believe, to everything is personalize the experience. That's the principle. And the action step would specifically be by individualizing the moment. So I'll give you an example. A few years ago, after I had left Disney, I got a call from my old boss and he says, hey, I want you to go to lunch with Michael. And I was like, oh my goodness, Michael's insurance guy, he's going to try to sell insurance to me. And I was like, wah, wah, wah. but as a favor to my boss, I'll go to lunch with Michael. So I reached out to Michael and Michael says, hey, meet me at the Bay Hill Country Club. And I'm like, the Bay Hill Country Club built by Otto Palmer, the great golfer? Absolutely. <laughs> so I show up on this particular day in my Sunday's best and we're sitting there looking at the menu and all of a sudden I see an older gentleman hunched over in the corner. I said, that's Otto Palmer. So being the bashful person that I am, I get up, I walk over to Otto Palmer. I say, Mr. Palmer, thank you for being a great uh, person, a, a great athlete. Thank you for what you've done for golf. And Otto Palmer looks up at me and he says, thank you, young man. And I proceed to take out my phone to take a selfie, but there were people standing behind Otto Palmer that started to close in. And I heard the song on my head, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do when we come for you? I said, this is probably not a good idea to take a selfie with Otto Palmer. So I go back and I'm sitting with Michael and he's turned red and he's laughing. He's like, what are you doing? There are no photos allowed with Otto Palmer here at the country club. And I said, Michael, I didn't know. So we laughed it off. And Michael didn't try to sell insurance to me. A couple of weeks go by and I'm at an event. I'm, I'm about to leave the stage. And they said, you can't leave the stage. I'm like, why? They take out of this bag, this hat from the Bay Hill Country Club that had been autographed by who? Otto Palmer. I didn't know Michael was in the audience that day. He came up afterward. We took a picture and still he didn't sell insurance to me. A few months passed by, unfortunately, Otto Palmer passes away. And I call Michael, and we were just re reminiscing when I embarrassed myself at his country club. And I said, Michael, I want to buy not one, not two, but three life insurance policies from you. And he said, why? I said, because you understand when you sell, that's a transaction. But when you individualize the moment by personalizing it, that's a relationship. So now I want a relationship with you and your company because you personalized an experience for me. That's why I believe that principle is probably one of the most important principles that everyone should think about. I, I love that because I, I have conversations with my team all the time around moving beyond the transaction because a lot of customer service, cu customer support organizations are driven by transactions. And I'm all the time saying we got to move beyond the transaction. Like it's about a longer term relationship with the customer. It's about really understanding what's important from their point of view, really getting as much of that personalized and contextual information as you can, you know, to really give a, a different experience. So yeah, that example resonates. Can't, can't quite match the Arnold Palmer example, <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, I, I love it. Very good. Very good. Like you've got extensive experience in the hospitality industry and as a former sales director for the Disney Institute, what advice would you give to aspiring leaders in the customer service sector to excel in their roles and make a lasting impact? To excel in your roles, number one, start with what is it that drives you to lead right now? The job of a leader is not to motivate and inspire people to work harder. Hear me. The job of the leader is to invite people on a journey to discover the leader within themselves while they are walking with you. So what really drives you to lead? Number one. Number two, how do you ensure that you are modeling resilience and brilliance and platinum service every single day from the time you receive an email to your tone in responding to a question from your team members? Because leadership is caught and taught. Everything speaks. Number three, how do you begin to invite the team to focus on what went well with the customer journey? Because there will be plenty of opportunity to focus on what went wrong. But when we look at what went well, that becomes the positive emotional deposit that encourages people to keep going. Number four, how do we begin to ensure 
that everyone understands that not only are we customer centric, but we also want to teach you financial intelligence. How does the company make money and why is the customer so important? And then number five, make sure you have fun every single day because a hopeful, happy leader is a helpful leader. I love just so many nuggets in there. You know, we could spend another hour just talking about all those, those nuggets. I've been mean, really, really good. I mean, what one that does resonate with me is really, you know, calling out what what's gone well. And if I have a kind of philosophy, every meeting we start, we have a call out around like who do you want to acknowledge what went well, like who did a really good job. So you're starting with that kind of positivity, and yeah, you move on to then. Well, you know, what do we need to focus on? What are the opportunities to improve? But you started off with really acknowledging what has gone well and, and calling out people for that. I think it's really, really important. So lots, lots of nuggets there. Really appreciate it. And you, and you, you talk about one word that I think is a great trigger for the next question. Like you talk about resilience, right? And I know you have a new book uh, out just released and it's called Resilience at Work, how to coach yourself into a thriving future, all about the ability to cultivate re resilience. So we have a lot of su customer support leaders listening, you know, why is that ability to cultivate resilience important for them? Resilience allows you to bounce back better. When you bounce back better, you begin to look at what can work instead of what didn't work. And it informs you to realize that, listen, things are going to happen. But resiliency allows us to bounce back with how can we figure it out instead of we can't figure it out. So I'll give you an example. At Ritz-Carlton, they teach the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? If you start with the answer is yes, that you're starting with, we're going to be resilient no matter what happens in this transaction or exchange with the customer. That's why resiliency is important because it becomes that muscle, that muscle memory that you develop that no matter what happens, we want to make sure we do. We create a win, win, win. The customer wins, the individual wins, the company and business wins. I, I love it. And again, that whole concept of resilience is something that's really becoming important, I think, in, in so many aspects of life, including you know, the, the business world. So I'm really looking forward to reading your new book and, and delving into it in a lot more detail. I do have one question that is not something we, we talked about, but I'm going to ask it. I read your book and I was absolutely fascinated by one aspect of your career that you outlined. And it was really when you had that opportunity to go work for Ritz Carlson and you decided not to. I'd love to understand what was the motivation for that decision? Because, you know, looking at it, it seemed like, wow, that's a, such a great opportunity, at, you know, at that stage in your career. Like, why wouldn't you take the role? What was the motivation there? So such a great question. And I don't get this question often. But what a lot of people don't know is I was born in Buffalo, New York, which is the third poorest city in the United States, according to the U.S. Census. So I never was exposed to a luxurious type of environment. Uh, at best, our family vacations were spent in little motels, lodges. So I, I didn't have a concept of what a Ritz-Carlton was. So when I was offered the job, quite frankly, I didn't think I was good enough. I, I didn't think I could fit into the culture. And it was in that moment when I look back so many years, it's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're not that holds you back. So I turned the job down at Ritz Carlton, stayed working at a day's in because that was my comfort level. And that was what I believe my self-worth at that time. Well, I, I, I love that vulnerability, Simon. I, it, gets, it kind of intrigued me when I was reading through, through the book. And, and you know, I, that, that explains it fully and, and that concept of, you know, understanding or you know, who, who you think you're not. I really like that one as well. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. You know, uh, so a lot of vulnerability there. So thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, first, or sorry, finally, before I ask the last question, really think, uh, loved the conversation, loved your book, looking forward to reading your next book on resilience. I've enjoyed the kind of insights that you provided here today. And then for our audience, like where can folks keep up with your work? Where can they kind of hear more of your insights and, and learn more about what Simon Bailey is about? Yes, they could go to simontbailey.com, simontbailey.com. Very good. That sounds straightforward. And uh, hopefully everyone can, can uh, go there and get more insights and knowledge from the great journey that you have been on and, and are still on. 
So Simon, th thank you for the time today. Really appreciated our conversation. Thank you for having me.